the diamond sutra does have one thing. The whole sutra is concerned with how to create inner emptiness, how to become utterly empty within. And once you are empty within, immediately you are free. These are the two ways of, this, of saying the same thing. As in Sufi terminology, we say Anatomata. The moment you are empty within, the ego has dissolved. You are empty. There is no, there is nothing that creates an obstruction in the flow of that which is. And that very moment, you are filled with something which is a hidden All you need to do is to attain to this inner emptiness or attain to prana. The other should automatically happen. Baka, the moment the drop merges in the ocean, as such the drop has a key to emptiness. An emptiness cannot remain for long immediately. It becomes ocean. Now we begin with the sutras. Thus have I heard at one time I am These sutras have been remembered by Buddha's disciple Anand. And one thing to be remembered, all sutras begin in a unique way. Thus have I heard. This is an important things, very important. Thus have I heard. He is not saying anything with sutra. What I am saying, you do not have to do. And Anand is not giving his own interpretation to meaning to the way to Buddha. He says, thus have I heard, I have heard it. Maybe there would have been something wrong with my hearing system. So I do not want to add anything. And it is now left to your consciousness to understand what Buddha has said. When Buddha died, all the disciples gathered together to collect whatsoever Buddha had said in those 45 years. Anand was the only one who lived continuously for those 45 years to Buddha. He was the most authenticated, authenticated in all the time. Others have heard, but they had heard from others. Sometimes they were with Buddha, and other times they were not with Buddha. Because they had to go on errands to spread the message of peace far and near. Only Anand had lived with Buddha like a shadow. Thus Anand relates. But the beauty is that he never said Buddha said this. He simply says, thus have I heard. The difference is greater between thus have I heard or Buddha said this. He does not say Buddha said this because he says, how am I to say what Buddha had said? All I can say is, this is what I have heard. What Buddha said only he knows. What he meant only he knows. And all that I can remember is what I have heard. My capacities are limited. He may have meant something else. I may have forgotten a few words or reduced the gaps or I may have 
added a few words of my own. This is the great sincerity. He could have claimed that this is what Buddha said. I was present. I am an eyewitness. And he was in fact an eyewitness. Nobody can deny that. But look at the human creation and the same as how I feel. Buddha was saying, I was saying, I can only believe what I have heard. Maybe right, it may not be. I may have interfered, or I may have interpreted, or I may have forgotten a few things, because that time the recording system was not there. Just as we have, I am speaking, simultaneously a recording process is being taken, it records everything as it is spoken, in the same gestures, with the same gaps, with the same modulation, but that was not available to me. All possibilities are here. I am not an enlightened yet. Anand was not yet enlightened, so he says, This is all that I can say, I can write for. Thus have I heard. Thus have I heard at one time the Lord dwelt at Shabbat. Early in the morning, the Lord dressed put on his clothes, took his begging bowl, and entered the great city of Shabbat with the colored arm. When he had eaten and returned from his ground, the Lord put away his begging bowl and filled, washed his feet, and sat on the seat arranged for him, crossing his leg, holding his body upright and mindfully fixing his attention in front of him. While all these only details are needed. This is the way of the Masters. This you will be surprised at when Anand says he goes to very small details. One never knows. When you are reporting about a Buddha, you have to be very careful. Even this much he reports again and again, such a small thing. And there is a reason. Every gesture, every movement often awakens one. It carries Silent message. Early in the morning, the Lord dressed, put on his clothes, took his bed in gold, and entered the great city of Shabbat with the colored arm. Anand is following him like a shadow, a silent shadow, just to watch him. Just to watch Buddha is the transition, and he watches everything he is. When he had eaten and returned from his gum, the Lord put away his baking bowl and the cloth, washed his feet and sat on the seat arranged for him. When for the first time with the sutras were translated into Western languages, the translators were Greatly puzzled. Why this continuous repetition? It goes on and on like that. Again it will be, and again this repetition. Why are these small things related? They could not understand. They thought this is repetition, and this is an unnecessary repetition. It is not needed at all. What is the point of it all? But they missed 
What Anand is saying that Buddha pays attention to small things as much as to big things. For a Buddha there is nothing small and nothing big, just one thing. When he takes his bed and bowl, why is this big thing? Buddha takes his bed and bowl. We take things not in an open way. In the morning you are going to dress up to go to work. You open your cupboard. You take out this shirt, throw it on the nearby place, then you take out the next one. Are you respectful to the shirts that you are taking out from the cupboard? The shirt that you have discarded to wear on that particular day has once adorned and protectively gave you intelligence. But in most of the cases, we are violent in such things. When we return from work, have you ever observed how we take out our clothes and how we take care of them? Something that protected you, something that gave you an elegance, we are violent in. Buddha is me. When he picks up the bowl, he is respectful to you. He picks it up meditatively with a prayer that as I go, you collect the arms. It may be possible that he has gone with the bed and bowl. He hasn't collected any arms. He has to return because according to the rule, they have to just stand in front of the house not even ask for anything. If the householder does not come out, they move to the next. And by the time they have visited five houses, if nothing is collected, he goes back empty handed. So Buddha is respectful first to the bowl because it is in this bowl that he has to collect the arms. When we raise our hands in prayer, the hands, the palms create a gesture of a begging bowl. In fact, we are in a state of supplication. I am ready to receive, but are you ready to give me? The two things have to go simultaneously, your supplication, your humility of receiving and the one who has to give. When the two merges into one another, then the act of giving the arms or the act of collecting the arms is completed. He has to be respectful. You take a morsel in your hand, the morsel has all the capacity to give you nourishment to satiate your hunger, to give nourishment to various organs of the body at the physical level, then at the subtle level, are you receiving it meditatively or you are receiving it violently? Is your inner system is ready to absorb the food as it comes into the stomach to the esophagus and how does your inner system welcomes the morsel that comes to your stomach by releasing the digestive juices. Sometimes it happens you are eating something and you start benching. That means there is lack of coordination between the two aspects of the earth. The food that you are bringing the input and its preparation to receive the guest as it comes in. If you reach to a particular airport and there is no one to receive you, first you are reaching the 
Na vida a gente não permite que o capítulo se crie em direção a ele, tanto que o ensino pode é que se manifeste. Quando ele pega o seu bebê bom, ele é respeitoso do bebê bom, como ele deveria ser para qualquer outro. Tudo que é a criação de Deus, seja o bebê bom ou o bebê bom, é o bebê bom. God or anyone else. It reflects the creativity of the creation. You will recall how the that how the Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to create designs, spiritual designs, on the clay pots. So the moment you pick up, you are Attracted to this fish, and that particular design has captivated you. Then, when the food is cooking now, by looking at the design that is there, because you remember this begging bowl has been touched by Shabaho Kuna. Whenever a master touches something, he adds something of his dimension to it. Something of his inner spirit, and the moment your hands are sensitive, you are connected to the same energy field. You are lost in the thoughts of the master. The process of meditation, the process of mindfulness, is within your spirit. So he is respectful to everything, small and big. And when he puts on his cloak. Or puts his dress on. He is so mindful and absolutely alert that this particular cloak is going to protect me from the rain, from the cold breeze. Also, it is going to give me a particular kind of elegance. He is not mechanical. When you put on your clothes, you are mechanical. You let your spouse feed you. You put on your shirt. You put out one shirt. You throw it on the nearby couch because you don't like this. This does not go with this particular set of outfit that you want to wear on that particular day. You took out a pair of socks. No, that's not suitable to do. Are you going to put away? In the same way as you have taken it out. No, I do not have time for all these things. I am already late, and I have to rush to do it. This is mechanical. You know mechanically how to put it on. So what is the point of paying attention? To it? You sit down on the car. Uh, sit down in the car. Automatically, like a mechanic, mechanical in a mechanical manner, your steering moves out of the compartment. When it is to the office, are you respectful to this? Your mind goes on moving into a thousand and one direction. You take a shower, but you are very disrespectful to the shower. You have not been there. Instead, you have been somewhere else. You eat. You are disrespectful to the food. You are not there. You simply go on swallowing the food inside you. You go on doing your things habitually and mechanically. All of you call it as physical movement. When Buddha does a thing, he utterly did. He is knowing. He is totally mindful. This is mindfulness. You are mindful of every small thing. Then, some total of these moments of mindfulness will bring all this. When we are eating and we turn to the Lord, the Lord put away His bedding bone and cloak. Because tomorrow again he will need the bedding bowl and the cloak. 
then he goes to Hindu, he goes to speak and sat on this seat a week to him. Crossing his legs, holding his body upright and mindfully fixing his attention in front of him. You know when you are watching the plants with a pose, the pose connects to the one end connects to the water supply the tap. The other end you are holding in your hand to sprinkle the water wherever you want. If there is a dent in the hose, the supply of the water will not flow. The hose has to be without a peak or thing. When you sit down, it is not just an ordinary sitting. In that position, firstly when you sit down, you are connected to the gravitational force of the earth. Only a very small portion is connected to the gravitational force of the earth. As compared to when you lie down, your entire body is in contact with the earth. The gravitational force of the earth. When you sit down, you are only sitting on the seat and that area is much less than the you And when you sit with your back upright, then the flow of energy is not displayed. When you sit down and pray, you sit down to the back of the And for that, the posture in which the yoga calls it Vajrasana when you bend your knees under the seat and you sit down on that, you create your own seat to sit down. You are not sitting on the ground, they are ground. Instead, you have created your own seat by bending your knees and holding your soul of the feet towards one another and you sit down in that posture. When you sit in that posture, your back can never be bent. In yoga, this is called Bhajrasana and according to Islamic tradition, it is called Dodhani. It is this posture that is used for prayers or for any other occasion. The back remains a screen. These are minor details. And they are worth relating. And then, when he fixes his attention in front of him, the commandments, the Sufi Kalmas, Nazar Bar Kadam, your eyes, your gaze is fixed in your feet. Not anywhere else. You watch the people walking, they look at the left, look at the right, turn at the back to look at something, but they do not fix their attention on their feet. The natural sign of the they stumble upon something because the eyes are not focused on the feet in front. Buddha is sitting. When he sits, his attention, his gaze is fixed in front of him. These are minor details, but worth relating. Because they bring the quality of Buddhahood, the quality of mind to it, the quality of awakening, that the awakening one is mindful of such a small thing. And if you pay attention to those fine details, Something begins to grow into you even, even before Buddha begins to send it. Or you are ready to receive his inner wisdom. Receive the energy field of Buddha as it is going to be communed to you through the words that will overflow. How all these minor details or the energy field can be communed to you? Words are simply the means to translate those thoughts. When you find the things put together, they repair those. I have watched Buddhas for 15 years. 
breaking the engagement, it is lesson in mindfulness. When the master is going out of the house, when you are coming out of the house, your back is facing the, the door. When he reaches out of the door, he turns back towards the door. Now he has to say the final prayer that I will be away from this place. Keep this place in union with thy mind. Keep this place in union with thy mind. And then he turns towards the destination, towards the heart. And he starts back to the When he returns, he is facing the path, facing the door. So the moment the door becomes, or the house comes in sight, says the prayer, thank you that you have kept this place in union. Keep this passage also in union. Filled by the, thy light, see, and then he enters. And when he is entering the house, he casts his glance in all the direction to first look at the energy field. If there is anything he does to clean his own way, then he enters. Wherever he goes, First, he casts a glance to that city. So, all those who are ready, who are on the borderline, they reach him in one way or Somehow the, or the other, they may receive a message from someone, look, this person is here, go and meet him. Sometimes a strange people say, I have worked the big master for two years, day in and day out. It is a lesson in mindfulness. Each moment he lives in a way that what he is doing is irrelevant. Each moment he pours his attention into whatsoever he is doing. When he makes the gesture, he is totally different. The gesture. When he smiles, he is totally his smile. When he talks, he is totally his words. And when he is silent, he is totally his silent. To watch a living Buddha is a blessing in itself. How he walks, how he sits, how he makes gestures, how he looks at you. Each moment is a radiant moment of awareness. In Zen, there is a particular walk that is called Buddha walk. Sometimes you are walking fast. When you are walking fast, you are not following. Buddha walk is the calculated, the small steps, with the attention focused, deepened. Nazar bar kadam hosh bhattam Hayalit dar vatam Kilbar daram dhunam All these come together The eyes are fixed in front of the feet Every moment you are aware of the hosh bhattam Kilbar daram dhunam You are with the crowd you have to speak to your own And you are Aware of your destination, you are traveling to this road, but you know where you have to go. If you get distracted by the objects and beings along the path, you will get entangled in them. He said, We still have some time, let us look at this particular item in the shop. Or oh, that particular person is looking very attractive, let me just say hello to the person. You have been distracted. Nothing like this happens to you. The gestures with which the shakes and the masters 
look at me or at others is the addiction and the memory of those moments will continue to linger in your memory. This is why Anand reposed. There must have been great silence when he had been arranged his attire, washed his feet, sat on his seat arranged for him, sat with his back straight upright and focused his whole attention in front of him. This is what is this fixing your attention in front of yourself? That is a special Buddhist method called Anapana Satiyo, or the other name for it is Vipassana. This is mindfulness of the breath, Andi Nidhita. This is the meaning of focusing your attention in what Sufis call it, Kosh Dabdam. Nazar var kadam kosh dardam, hilvat darantam, safar darvatam. When Buddha is doing something, for example, dressing, then he is attentive to that part. When he is walking, he is attentive to walking. When sometimes you are in the company of the people, you are eating. And someone asks you something, Sometimes out of culture you have to respond. So you have to be aware of these distractions and not distraction to be found. A temporary pause. And when you say, look, I am eating. Let me finish the eating and I can respond. Because what you have asked me does not relate to eating. And at the moment when I am eating, I have to be mindful of this particular part. So I will respond to you afterwards. You will find it, find that you are crazy. Why can't you answer what I have asked you? And then, sometime during the conversation, many kind of emotions arise in you, specifically during those moments, the spouse show their anger towards one another. A television screen is turned on. If the family is there, daddy always does things like that. And either you swallow your anger or disagreement with it, and you just allow it to pass by. So the food that was going through the mouth, through the, going through the process of chewing, suddenly stops. The juices are released, the food has not gone inside, you get upset, my appetite is gone, I cannot eat anymore. Things like these happen on a day-to-day basis. But this is not the Buddha way. The spirituality is not coming for one hour, sitting down in meditation, listening to the discourse, listening to this, put on a dark. No. It is a moment to moment living. Moment to moment living. And living with mindfulness, with total awareness. So what is there in this dining sutra? All these things, they are not part of the spirituality. There is no commandment, there is no salah, there is no mantra, there is no prayer, there is no philosophy, there is nothing like that. What kind of thing is this? This is the good thing. When Buddha is doing something, for example, dressing, then he is acting to get it. When he is walking, he is attentive of his walking. When he is not doing anything, he is attentive of breath coming in and breath going out. But he is attentive each moment. Even while he is asleep, he is attentive. Anand asked Buddha once, 
A few years he had lived with Lisa and he was surprised that he remained in the same posture for a year. When he put his hand, it remained there the whole year. He must have looked many times. He must have sneaked in the night. It was worth watching how they did in the sea. And he was surprised and puzzled that he kept the same posture, the same posture the whole year. He could not hold his curiosity. One day he inquired, it is not right for me to get up in the night and look at you. I should not do such a thing, but I am curious about you. And I am anxious, I am puzzled. You remain in the same posture for the night. Do you sleep or you continue your behavior? You did not explain it. Sleep happens in the body. The day is an awakening. I remain awake. I am not the body in that particular message. Buddha says, I am not the body when I am aware of this. You see, but you are not aware of that statement. The sleep happens in the body. There remains something awake, that's why you are dreaming. If the mind was also sleeping, then there would be no dream. And that state is dream sleep. That state is dreamless sleep or the sound sleep. I am alert. Now the sleep is beginning to come and then it has come and settled. Now the body is relaxed and the limbs are relaxed, but I keep my awareness. Meditation is not one hour or one moment or something, it is a 24 hour session. It is not that you do it once a day or you are trained to do it. It has become your flavor. When sometimes people ask, how many how long do you meditate every day? And when I say I don't meditate anymore. So you have to stop meditating now? Yes, I have to stop. So they don't ask anything. Because they could not understand. To them meditation is an action. Yes, indeed it begins with your activity. And then it becomes a thing. Any act that you start with, you start with action. You have to do something. Then you suddenly, you reach to a point where the process becomes a spontaneous. You do not have to make an effort, but it is happening spontaneously. This is where you gather the momentum. And then you do not have to make any effort, but it is happening like an instant. It is not that you do it once a day or twice. And you are finished with it. It has to become your flavor. It has to become your climate. And when I say that any moment I may be amidst the crowd, I have a moment to think, I will write something. And while I am writing something on my iPhone, same time a call comes in. With the call coming in, that particular screen disappears, the call screen comes in, you respond to that person, and then pull back the screen where it has been on pause, complete that particular message, and paste it. So there is no discontinuity. It has become your flavor. It has become your climate. It should surround you wherever you are. Whatsoever you are doing, meditation continues like an undercurrent. Now again and again, you seek Makanshi. Now again and again, you seek Makanshi in the fine detail. And mindfully see his attention in front of him. He sat. Then many a monks approach to where the Lord was, saluted its feet with their heads, thighs walked around him, 
to the right and sat down on the one. To ask a question to a Buddha needs a certain attitude. Only then he will receive the answer. He can give the answer. But in order to receive the answer, a certain amount of inner preparation is needed. It is not that Buddha will not give the answer. You can ask very disrespectfully. Buddha will just give response. However, in that state of disrespectfulness and doubt, you will not receive the answer. Therefore, it is not a question that only when you are respectful with Buddha gives the answer, Buddha will give the answer anyway. But if you are not respectful, humble and receptive and feminine, you will not receive the answer. You will receive. The answers are received in a state of receptivity and receptivity is feminine. How you ask the question determines whether you will be able to receive the answer or not. Buddha continues of course to do. How you ask, in what mood are you receptive? Are you just curious? Or you are asking the question out of your accumulated knowledge? Or is your question idiocy? Are you asking just to test whether this man knows or not? Are you asking from a state of knowledge or from a state of not knowing? Are you humble and surrendered? Are you ready to receive the gift if it is given to you? Will you be open? Will you welcome it? Will you, will you take it to your heart? Will you allow it to become a seed in your heart? Each response that the Master gives, answer of Master gives, it is a seed that has to be planted with the reading tree. A question to a professor is a different thing. It needs a certain quality in you, only then you will be benefited by it, not otherwise. So it is a totally a different kind of a climate that surrounds the world.